Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Simon. I didn't put my details on my slides. Um, I've spoken here once before. I work for Catalyst Cloud as a Python developer. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk about a small little fun side project I've been playing around with at home. So, uh, Shard Your Pi Hole running a network wide ad blocker on the public internet. And that's the important part. Um, so, adverts, adverts suck, they're boring, they're annoying. Um, but more than anything, uh, they can be risky. They can carry um, malware uh, tracking analytics. They're a huge privacy nightmare. They're just generally awful. Um, a lot of sites do rely on adverts as well for their revenue. So they're not all bad, but even when there's no malintent there, um, the problem with the way ads are included on pages is, for example, loading HTTP content on a secure page uh, can pose its own security risks. So generally, I prefer to avoid ads whenever possible. And if the content providers give me an option to pay for their content via Patreon or, or Copy or any number of other donation platforms, I'll opt to give them a bit of money there instead. Um, so I set out on a mission to block all the ads. And the one that most people know about are browser-based ad blockers. And the one I personally recommend is uh, uBlock Origin. That may change a few years ago. I was advocating for Adblock Plus and a whole bunch of stuff happened around that and they started uh, shelling out money to provide certain ads and you could pretty much just pay them off to get, get past their filter. Um, so it turned into a terrible thing. uBlock Origin is pretty good at the moment. That may change. So um, if you're watching this talk a year from now, um, that may be completely different. Um, they have extensions in Chrome, Firefox, probably most major browsers. Um, the downside with, with browser-based ad blockers is that they are browser-based. Um, they only live in your browser. They don't do anything for your native clients on your desktop. Uh, so if you're running Microsoft Office or Microsoft Word, uh, all, of, all of those pieces of software have a lot of telemetry around them. They phone home with a lot of user data. Just um, generally, you, you can't stop that with a ad, ad block um, in the browser. Um, mobile phones as well. Um, there's a little to no support on mobile phones. It's slowly changing. Uh, mobile phone browsers are coming with built-in ad blockers, and some of them, I believe, now support some extensions. Um, but again. The problem there is that they're still browser-based, and they don't uh, th they don't do anything for uh, native applications on your phone, which also have telemetry. Um, so, the solution is, in my opinion, network-wide ad blocking. At least it's a tool you can throw at the problem. The benefits of network-wide uh, ad blocking are that um, it works for blocking ads and analytics in native apps, as I said, and it also protects less savvy people on your network, like your family members, uh, flatmates, people who don't know about ad blockers, don't run them for any reason. Um, if you're in the in enviable position of being this sysadmin for your family, for your home, <laughs> um, it can be beneficial to yourself if everyone on your network is also protected. Um, so this provides just a, a base level of protection for anyone connecting to your network. Um, so there's one project that I've looked at so far. Um, I, as I understand, it's not the first project out there. There have been other ones, but this one's called PyHole. And it's a DNS black hole or DNS proxy, which is designed to run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, these have been around for a few years. I'm sure most people probably know about them, probably own a few. I own two. I bought a, a Model B like six or seven years ago. And then a few years later, I bought a Model 3. And both of them have sat and collected dust for so long. And I thought, ah, oh, finally, a, a project that I can put my Raspberry Pis to use for. So the way it works, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so the way it works is clients on your network talk to your um, Raspberry Pi DNS pr proxy um, as their primary DNS server. 
and that is configured with a blacklist, which allows most traffic through, but blocks um, analytics, ads, um, just any domain that's on its blacklist. Uh, anything that makes it through its um, blacklist just goes to any upstream DNS provider that you specify. Um, so in the Raspberry Pi itself, you just tell it what DNS to use. And it looks a lot like this. Um, this is just some sample so sample um, request blocked on my network. You can see my IP there, but don't worry, it's dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so excuse my, my terrible network diagrams. I'm not a network engineer. Um, <laughs> but you have your clients inside your home network with a router with an interface out to the World Wide Web. Um, the naive implementation, you just point your clients at your um, Raspberry Pi DNS proxy on the network. Uh, the recommended way to do it is actually to just leave your clients getting their D DNS settings uh, from the DHCP server on your router and configuring your router to point at the Raspberry Pi for um, DNS resolution. And then, like I said, the DNS server goes out to Google or Cloudflare DNS resolvers, whatever you want. Um, the Raspberry Pi has a lot of great features, um, community block lists, so you're not limited to just what the vendor provides. You can create your own block lists as well, but there's um, dozens of, of great block lists with tens of thousands of domains on them. Um, it's sort of a fool's game. You're never going to ever block everything, but they do a pretty good job of blocking a lot of known, known um, bad actors out there. You can also define regex filters um, for either whitelisting or blacklisting any demands that don't come onto a block list. Um, there's great tooling around testing if demands are blocked or if they're not blocked, and if they are blocked, which list they appear on. Um, so you can really track down why a request that you might feel you need to let through is not getting through, and you can do something about it. Um, they also have great logging and history and searching, which is really cool. Um, I've spent only a small amount of time exploring my data because I don't know that much about DNS, so trying to understand what's actually happening here, um, I still need to learn a lot more about, but it's genuinely really interesting. And um, this is actual real data that I took an hour ago. Um, I'm not sure what that huge spike was. <laughs> I'm gonna go have a look at that when I get home. But um, yeah, this is data for the last 30 days. On the right-hand side, you can see that's pretty much general usage except for a large spike. And uh, if you're wondering on the left-hand side there, um, I shut the server off for about a week just while we were troubleshooting some other networking problems. Um, but there was a huge spike in the middle and uh, that is because my particular instance is sitting out on the internet, so my home network wasn't talking to it, but uh, somebody else out there was. <laughs> but that's coming later. Um, if I just have a look, um, so w w one of the tools exposed via the admin interface is just a list uh, of the top block domains for the last 30 days. Um, by far, the worst one is Microsoft.com. I, th I think uh, it's not very specific from the domain name, but I think it might be an Office 365 on my flatmate's computer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was very surprised. It blows everything away by almost an order of magnitude. It's quite, quite big. Um, there's problems with running a uh, Ad block a, a DNS proxy like this on your network. Um, because as you can see, I have logs of everything, uh, which I can browse at any time. And as you can see, uh, in a previous screenshot, I can see the clients that it's coming from as well. So I'm not sure how I feel about it privacy-wise. <laughs> um, this is one of the things I really, really wanted to do was block YouTube ads on my phone. And I turned on my, my um, pie hole, 
and I got a YouTube ad and I'm like, hey, what's up? Is it working? And I spent an hour debugging it and didn't get to the bottom of it and I just always get YouTube ads. And looking online, reading all the forums, there's a very good reason for that. YouTube serves their ads from a million different subdomains, which are dynamic and change with the time. I've just shown a sample of four of them, but it's a sort of predictable pattern, but pretty much random characters. And people have had some success writing regexes to filter these out, but it, it varies country to country. Um, and you can't just block the googlevideo.com domain because that's where the actual content comes from as well. So p people have tried writing regexes for it. People have tried writing um, static lists for it. Um, one of the limitations they found is that someone wrote a list so large it just killed the Raspberry Pi. Um, <laughs> and they were still getting, still getting ads as well. <laughs> So Google have millions of subdomains, and this isn't really a problem that can be solved by filtering DNS um, requests. So there's a lot of questions about this. I'm not the only one with this question. And everyone says, hey, uBlock does a really, really good job of doing this. Um, why is it so bloody hard for the pie hole to do it? And there's a lot of anger. And for years and years, people have been asking this question, and people have been trying to solve this question and writing scripts. Um, and like I said, uh, filtering DNS requests is a really blunt tool. uBlock um, can block domain names. Uh, it can block URL fragments, and it can also block um, fragments on the page. So uh, it has regexes of, I don't know, like HTML or JavaScript content that it will strip out of the page dynamically as it loads. Um, so it can do a lot more than um, just filtering and black holing domain names. The pie hole can only do domain names. So an example of this that I took an hour ago, again, <laughs> it's just from my own uBlock origin. I just opened up YouTube. And you can see uh, it's highlighted what it's actually blocking or what's, what's triggered the filter. And most of it is not the domain name itself, but part of the page fragment. So it offers a lot more granular, um, a lot more useful blocking. The other thing that the ad blocker has going for it, uh, well, fund fundamentally, it's blocking HTTP requests, not DNS requests here. Um, but also, it has the context of what page you're on and what page your request is going to, which is an important piece of information that it can use to make a decision about whether to block content or not. Another problem, um, not one that I personally have too much problems with, but uh, other people who are running uh, homes full of smart devices run into, is that uh, clients on their network uh, don't respect their router's DHCP rules for DNS. They'll hard code their own one and just completely bypass whatever your Raspberry Pi is trying to do. Um, which is a real pain because IoT devices can be really, really invasive, uh, cameras, sensors, all sorts of things on them. Um, it's really, uh, th they have a broad view of your life. They know a lot about you. So you, if you're blocking um, network requests for privacy concerns like that, this can be a real problem. Um, fortunately, people who have been at this a lot longer than me and have a lot more time um, have suggested workarounds to this problem. Scott, Scott Helm did a really good uh, write-up on this uh, more than a year ago. And the long and short of it is a uh, extra firewall appliance on his network, uh, which catches stray DNS requests and forwards them to his Raspberry Pi. And uh, there's a link there and the name of the title if you want to go find out how that's done. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, um, granularity is the biggest problem uh, with blocking DNS requests. Sometimes there's a genuine need for exceptions to filters, um, and DNS filtering is a blunt tool. Um, so the first example I ran into was uh, within about an hour of firing this thing up on my network, my flatmates came to me and said, well, I, I warned them. I said, hey, there's, there's a ad block running across the whole network. 
um, just a heads up, let me know if anything's funny. And within an hour, within an hour, someone came to me and said, uh, yeah, I think it's broken. It was the three now website. They couldn't stream any videos because that website checks for the, uh, all the ad content and will refuse to play any content until the ads are valid. And that's just anti ad blocker technology. Now, the unfortunate thing was uh, that I looked up which domains were being blocked and what was causing the website to break. And I said, sure, I'll just whitelist it. But that would whitelist that domain for all clients uh, on all devices, all applications for the whole network. It's just, it's a really blunt tool. Um, by comparison, you blog origin. Uh, you could you could turn off your ad blocker just for the the one site, um, or the workaround that we <laughs> that we agreed on at the time was that I just set their laptops uh, DNS to go straight out to Google and bypass my ad filter because I wanted my ad filtering goodness. <laughs> um, so that was part one, R running a network wide ad blocker on the on our home network. Um, but as I sort of alluded to before, um, I wasn't just running it on my home network. I was hosting this in on a public cloud, um, the Catalyst Cloud, to be specific. Um, the reason I did this was because I wanted all that ad blocking goodness with me wherever I went, 24/7, on my phone, on the go, on the bus, walking around town. Um, I wanted it everywhere, save data, privacy everywhere. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of problems with putting it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how not to do it. This is how I did it, um, at first, anyway. So you take your Raspberry Pi, and you put it on the internet. And within the first week, my traffic looked like this. Um, so uh, on the right, you can see my, my normal traffic. That's actually normal, that's fine. The three huge spikes were completely unknown clients. No idea who they were. Um, making 1,800 requests within the space of about five minutes. Um, that, that's the really tall one. And if we zoom in on that really tall one, um, this is what the requests actually looked like. It's coming from a client that doesn't have any host info, it just has an IP address, which <coughs> makes me concerned for a reason I'll go into a little bit later. Um, and those requests, you can see in the type column, are PTR DNS requests, and I did a lot of Googling around this. Uh, PTR DNS record is, uh, it's, a, it's a pointer record, and it's used for reverse DNS lookups. So for every A record, there may exist a, uh, I should explain what an A record is. An A record is the most basic um, DNS record. It just maps a domain name, google.com, to a IP address. And a PTR record does the inverse of that. It maps an IP address to a domain record. PTR records may not exist, but often a lot of DNS servers will create them dynamically automatically when you register an A record. Um, so there'll be a reverse mapping there. And there is some client talking to my DNS server, um, doing about 2,000 reverse DNS lookups. And I still haven't got to the bottom of this, what they were trying to do, because the data is pretty scarce. One suggestion I've seen um, my colleague made to me was that they may be trying to do a reverse DNS lookup inside my network. If they made an assumption that the Raspberry Pi was sitting inside my home network and exposed to the internet, then they may be able to um, use the DNS server to discover um, what else is in my network. Um, fortunately for me, this is the good thing about having it uh, nowhere near my network out on the public. So one other problem I ran into trying to use this on the go uh, was that configuring uh, my mobile devices to use a custom DH uh, DNS server is not all that straightforward. 
Uh, it works really nicely on the home network when your phone is connected to the Wi-Fi and your router is providing uh, your DNS servers via DHCP. But when you actually go to try and put a hard code, a DNS server into your phone, it's not all that straightforward. Um, I found it was possible on my Samsung Galaxy S10 to specify a DNS server. But the problem I ran into was that I couldn't have both a dynamic IP uh, and a static DNS. I had to have both um, dynamic or both static. And there may be a third party app um, which can work around this in <laughs> some really black magic ways, which are probably more of a privacy violation than <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> trying to solve in the first place. Um, and yeah, so so on on Wi-Fi you can't just put put in your your um, static DNS server. On mobile data, similarly, you're restricted to whatever DNS service your mobile carrier um, provides for you. Um, so it turns out um, that's a no-go. The next problem of running on the public internet, um, and this is the first thing you really find when you do a lot of Googling about running public DNS resolvers, are DNS amplification attacks. Um, these are a huge problem on the internet, as it turns out. People running um, insecure DNS resolvers um, because DNS doesn't doesn't verify the source IP. You can forge DNS packets with a custom source IP, make a request to the um, DNS server, and the DNS server will respond to whatever source IP that it says in the packet. So you put your target's source IP in there and make the request, and your uh, DNS server will reply to the target. Now, DNS can return a lot more information than you request. So you can make a small request and that will return a large amount of data. And so by targeting the large amount of data at your targets, you can turn a very small amount of upload bandwidth on your side into a very large amount of bandwidth hitting your target. And so you multiply this across as many open DNS resolvers as you can and you can really devastate um, a target, and not just the target themselves, but the surrounding infrastructure as well, if they're hosted on a, another public cloud network or a smaller um, VPS provider, um, it can cause huge problems for the infrastructure as well. If they're trying to load balance, um, or even trying to just absorb and drop the packets, it can still uh, overwhelm their border um, the network perimeter clients. So uh, they, they really don't like people running public DNS servers. And a lot of ISPs, if they find you running a public DNS server on the network, they'll ask you to close it down. Which brings me to the right way to do it. Um, and that is Pi-hole plus VPN. And I think in my case, this will probably mean I'll close off all connections to my cloud server. Um, except for access via my VPN, and I'll keep it in the cloud. Uh, but probably the best option is to run it in your home network with a VPN to your home network. Um, it also solves a lot of the security problems. Uh, the the Pi Hole server doesn't have that it, it doesn't have SSL support by default. Uh, you can configure an SSL cert on it. Certbot, um, pro the, 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 the Certbot um, certificate automation that is most commonly used with Let's Encrypt doesn't know how to automatically configure the HTTP server for you. It's pretty straightforward, but you have to go and look how to do it yourself. And if you're not that familiar with SSL, um, it can be a bit of a learning curve, but it's pretty much essential uh, to protect your admin panel with SSL because of all of the information that's in there. Um, so maybe if I do this talk again at any meetup, I'll be able to talk about uh, my VPN setup. I'm probably going to look at WireGuard as my VPN um, gateway. But yeah, 
Uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, you showed the listing of uh, what the, um, the DPR requests from your from your strangers. Yes. Um, so you said that you suspected two things: one, the numeration of clients on your network, and the other, a DNS implementation scam. Yep. I favour the former because all of those IRSC and people need it all over the boot space. Yeah, that that's what my colleagues suggested. Yeah. Enumeration. Yep. Yes. Uh, it seemed to work fine. I think it's just an analytics endpoint. They didn't complain about it not working. It's been running for the last few months. And Office 365 is a paid subscription. It's probably just phoning home some sort of analytics. Yeah, there's, a free of it. Yeah, but there's Office Online, yeah. There's a, a fascinating article I read about Facebook looking at messages that people typed that they didn't see. Mm. So the oh, analytics yes. about every character they yes. typed, we're all going back to Facebook. They know everything, yeah. even if you don't actually hit send. Questions? Would you consider using server HTTPS? Yes, I have considered that. Um, there are some articles out there. It doesn't look as straightforward, but I will consider it. Yeah, <coughs> no, it's, it's definitely an option. But I think um, I think a VPN to the um, to the DNS server uh, is probably about as good. I mean, that's essentially what. It's probably the same protection that um, DNS over HTTPS does, right? Because that's just an SSL tunnel to um, Google or um, Cloudflare's DNS resolver, and then they resolve the DNS for you and send you back the results. So at least in this case, you would be in control of the DNS server um, rather than them having all the centralized DNS requests. The, the most visited page of my WordPress site is my login page, my admin login. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you.